Our sermon scripture today is the Old Testament lesson, uh, lectionary reading for the day and comes to us from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 through 14a. After the king was settled in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am living in a house of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. But that night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, This is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt. I have been moving from place to place, with the tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel, and will plant them so that they no longer, so that they no longer are no longer disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore, as they did at the beginning, and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all of your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. May God bless to us this reading and hearing of his holy word. Amen. I was reading from the New International Version. I don't know what you had up there. Um, we read in the psalm this morning that uh, David had a pretty good relationship with his Lord, didn't he? he God loved him with a steadfast love, and, and he had led him through a lot of stuff in his life. He had all those battles that he was fighting on behalf of King Saul, and then when Saul went a little wacko, uh, David was sort of running for his life and, and having to hide from King Saul. And so there came a time when there was peace. The king could take a breath and stop leading the troops into battle. And that's kind of where this comes forth. But David, sitting, I don't twist very well. Right. Excuse my dad. Um, David decides, you know, God's been with me through all of this. I, I think I ought to build him a house. And so he tells Nathan this. And Nathan says, yep, yeah, go ahead and do it. What I find interesting in this text, first of all, there are two characters, basically. Three characters. God, Nathan, and David. And David has this desire to do something for God. And so he tells Nathan, and Nathan says, Ah, oh, yeah, that's good. The Lord's with you. Go ahead. And then, as we read along, we realize that God says, Nathan, you started talking before you had engaged to find out what I wanted. Have we ever found ourselves in a situation where we just said, Oh, yeah. As parents, perhaps, um, a child came to you and had a request to go somewhere, and you, your first impulse was, yeah, that's okay, that's fine. And then you find out more of the details, and you have to go back and say, you know, that's not such a good idea. Maybe you shouldn't do X, Y, or Z. I know that there were times in my sister's life, not mine, but in my sister's life, when she would want to go off with her friends to do something, and inevitably, those things would get her into trouble. 
I learned a lot. She was an older sister. So I learned a lot from watching her and thinking, hmm, don't think I'll try that. Hmm, don't think I'll do that. But there were times when my mother especially would say, yeah, that sounds like okay. And then dad would come in. And dad would kind of weigh all the possibilities, knowing his daughter full well. And he would say, nope, that's not happening on my watch. And normally there would erupt a big temper tantrum for my sister and uh, some name calling, which didn't last or get her very far. Uh, but sometimes we just react. We think, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Build a house for God, right? What could be wrong with that? Well, the thing that was wrong with that was that David had not really asked God what he wanted him to do. God, do you want a house? <clears throat> See, the problem with asking God for direction is we have to be willing to wait for the answer. And we also have to be willing to hear that the answer may not be what we want it to be. Now, I don't know about y'all, but there are times when I want what I want when I want it. And those times have not gotten me into serious trouble, but have certainly delayed me being able to experience what God wanted from me. In 2003, I had been serving a small church in Orlando, and the secretary had embezzled most of our money. It was a diff very difficult time for us, and it became very obvious to me that the church could not afford to pay me what they were paying me. And I couldn't afford to keep living like that. So I decided that I needed to try to make other alternative arrangements. And so I didn't know what I was going to do. I just knew that I couldn't stay there for very long. It wasn't hard feelings between anybody. It was just the circumstance, the way it was. And so I had been doing a lot of presbytery work at the time. And I thought, you know, I'd, I'd probably like to be a presbytery executive. And so I started sending out my resume and sent it places, had some interviews during the time. And, and then a church in a far distant land called Michigan. <laughs> Yay! I don't mean anything negative about Michiganders at all, uh, but I'm a Floridian. You can see that there might be some things that were new and unusual. I can tell you a whole lot of stories about what that experience was like, but I, I had gone ahead and I applied these places uh, at, for an executive presbyter position. And they called me, and I remember going, oh no. <laughs> I lived in Florida, with the exception of college and my seminary time, I've lived in Florida my entire life. Michigan has snow. <laughs> lake effect snow. And the lake effect snow affected me in lots of ways. I would be driving down the highway and there would be people, you know, whizzing past me and I had Michigan tags on my car, but I could feel myself going, I'm a Floridian! <laughs> I didn't want to go when it came right down to it, but I did. I had not asked God specifically what he wanted me to do, but I wanted to be a Presbytery executive. When I got there, I had only been there through one winter when I realized that the temperature gauge on your car does go down as low as minus 14. <laughs> I didn't see it any further below that, and I remember I was on my way to visit a church in the Presbytery that day, and I saw the temperature gauge going down, down, down. And I remember crying out to the Lord, get me out of here. 
Well, it took a little while. It took another year before doors started opening. And one of the things that happened in that time was I learned a very important lesson. I learned the lesson of waiting for God's answer. And I was spending some time talking with one of the pastors in the Presbytery who did spiritual direction kind of stuff. And after a year of meeting with Larry, he finally, I shared with him about wanting to go home. And uh, he said, after a while, I think you've learned the lesson God wanted you to learn. And I'm like, eh? what? What was the lesson? And he said, I think you finally learned it's about the power of love not the love of power. And when he said it, the tears welled up, and I knew that that was the lesson I had had to go to Michigan to, to learn. David was king. He had all kinds of power, but he didn't have the power to bring about what God wanted him to do. God called him from tending sheep to be a warrior king. And God didn't want somebody who was a warrior building a house for him. And as the story goes on, the next part of it that uh, is kind of check with God before you continue to do anything is Nathan. David says, this is what I want to do. Nathan says, yeah, go ahead and do it. And then that night, God says, Nathan, whoa, slow down. I don't want that. Have I ever? And so Nathan had to backtrack a little bit and go back to David and say, oops, sorry, David, I gave you the green light and God's giving you the red light, so we need to slow this process down. Has there been a time in your life when you have given someone some advice or the go-ahead and then realized I spoke a little too soon. I don't know about you, but there have been many times in my life when I have had to pull my foot out of my mouth. And that's kind of what Nathan had to do here, was to go back to the king and say, that's not what God wants, so you better not do it. One of the things that I think as Christians we have difficulty doing is discerning where God wants us to go. Is there anybody here who's got the hotline to God and always knows what God wants? Because I'd like to hook up into that plan. I think we struggle with that. And no matter how devoted we are, no matter how much we're willing to study scripture and pray, sometimes we're just not sure what God wants us to do. Now if we switch over to a couple of the other books of prophecy, we'll find out in Micah that God wants us to walk humbly and do justice and do these kinds of things. So God wants us to be doing things that are in line with his being. And it's not the kind of things that we can kind of draw plans for. It becomes a part of us as we grow closer to Christ. So we need to be able to develop that kind of sense of following Christ so slowly and knowing where to find God and Christ in our world. There's a story that's told about this young family that had just moved to a new neighborhood. And the two young boys, ages 8 and 10, were always getting into mischief. And the townspeople quickly learned that these two rascals were the ones causing trouble all around. And so the mother had heard that there was a new preacher in town who had a way with children that were kind of wandering on a wider path than what God would have. And so she made an appointment with the pastor for each of the boys to go talk to the preacher. The younger one was gonna be in the morning and the other one was in the afternoon. And so the younger one went in kind of shyly because the pastor was a big, imposing figure and so he sat the little boy down and he said Joshua where is God and the little boy kind of trembled didn't say anything and the next time the pastor said where is God the 
boy didn't say anything again. The third time, the pastor booms out, where is God? And with that, the little boy ran out of his office, ran all the three blocks home, went into his house, dove into the closet, and shook. A few minutes later, his older brother came in and said, what happened? And the guy says, we're in deep trouble this, this time. I says, what? He says, God's missing him when they think we did it. <laughs> Don't we sometimes feel like we don't know where to find God? We don't know where he is. Well, I assure you, he's not missing. Somehow along the journey, we are missing getting to where he is. It's not that he has moved. It's that life has taken us on a different path. I was very blessed to grow up in a Christian home. Never really wandered, you know, down a non-Christian path. My sister did that, and I learned from her. Uh, but even so, there are times when we feel that sense of, where is God? Whether we're going through difficult situations with family, or whether we're dealing with health issues, no matter what it is, sometimes we just feel like we don't know how to find God, or where to find him. Kind of reminds me of the prophet Elijah when he's up on the mountain. He's been running for his life, and he's in a cave, and, and he wants to hear from God. And there's lightning, and there's thunder, and all of that, and it's coming out, and that wasn't where God was. And you know the story. It finally gets to a still, small voice, a whisper, and that's where God was. But in order to hear the whispers of God, we have to be able to be quiet. Anybody here have trouble just sitting in silence? <laughs> it's hard to do. I remember a time in seminary when I was praying hard for something and, and I, I just felt almost oppressed by this presence. And I realized it was God, but I realized he was getting too close. And I remember kind of saying, back off. Guess what God did? He backed off for a while. I think we have this kind of relationship with God a lot where we want him. We want all of God. And then we're like, well, oops, maybe not that much. Could you do, you know, a little too much. For David, it was a similar kind of thing. David knew what it was like to have God's protection and God's guidance when he was on the battlefield. But when it came to a time of rest, of quiet, he didn't know what to do with himself. I think I'll build him a cathedral, you know, a house made of cedar. That ought to occupy me for a while. Have you ever had a great idea, a great plan to do something, and it didn't work out? We know from reading more of the books of Samuel and on into Kings and reading the Psalms especially, we know that David remained faithful, even though I'm sure when Nathan came back and said to him, sorry, no cedar house to build for you, God didn't want that. I'm, I'm sure David felt like that was a slap in the face. And I think we've all experienced that sort of thing to one degree or another, where we felt like God was just not getting on board with our plans. I will tell you, that's why churches fail. Because churches go about their business asking God to bless certain programs. And that's fine if, when you've started into those programs and those activities, you know that that's where God has led. I, I told Jeff that it was probably a little risky to ask me to preach here because the last two churches I've been a part of have closed. <laughs> <laughs> but he assured me that was not the case and he wasn't afraid. I said, okay, just wanted, you know, full disclosure here. 
Sometimes churches fail for a lot of reasons, but as you know, it is very difficult for mainline churches to survive in this day when we are entertained, in a day when not much is asked for from people. I mean, it, it's you can get the drift that I'm not a big fan of untraditional kinds of worship. Uh, I'm pretty much of a traditionalist, and I think there's something very special to the way we as Presbyterians order worship. There's a purpose in it. And sometimes I look at the order of worship for a church I've visited, and I go, you know, it's like a little here, a little there. Let's say a prayer here. Let's maybe sing a song. And, and there's no thread to tie it. And I do believe that God likes that thread that ties it together, that makes sense. When we think about this passage, we need to be able to ask ourselves, what have we sought to do? Not, not just in our own personal lives, but what have we sought to do as a part of the church? What have been our wonderful ideas as we reach out into the world to share Christ with people? And are we certain that that's what God has called us to? How many people are retired? <laughs> a few of us, right? When you first retired, did you have this sense of, I'm not sure quite what to do with myself right now? Many of us went through life being defined by what we did, what our job was. You meet new people and they say, oh, what do you do for a living? I'm a preacher. And they back up. <laughs> Many of us struggle with that, and I, I was telling Jane, I've had a number of surgeries over the last five years, and really had to be sitting and not going out and worshiping with the community because I wasn't able to do it. And I realized that I was struggling to find what was my purpose. What was my purpose anymore if I couldn't be a pastor? I was one of those that went right from college, from high school to college to seminary. And so been ordained for almost 44 years. And I was like, what do I do now? And when I was able to sit back and just kind of ask that question again and again and again, doors started opening. And I kept feeling a little nudge, even though I wasn't sure I could do it. I hadn't preached in a number of years when I got back in the pulpit six months ago, seven months ago, doing supply preaching. And I thought, gosh, I don't know if I remember how to do it. And uh, friends assured me that I was never at a loss for words. And so uh, I think it's hard when we're making transitions in life. And that's what David was doing. David was making a transition from leading his people into war to just, just being king and modeling for them what it meant to be a good king. And if you read through the rest of the stories, you, you know that David was not perfect. David was far from perfect. None of the kings were perfect by any means. And yet, God promised David an inheritance. God promised that his descendants would be great. And of course, from that lineage, we have the Christ. What does God want from you? Not only what does he want from you, but what does he want of you? I noticed you'll have a food bank, um, a thrift store across the street, all kinds of wonderful ways to be reaching out to the community. You have a prayer list that is lengthy, you're praying for people. Sometimes in our lives, that's all we can do. It's not about promotions. It's not about what we can do to get ourselves somewhere. It's about humbling ourselves before God and inviting God to mold us and make us into the people he wants us to be. What does God want? I challenge you to Ask that question, not just today, but every morning. 
I'm not perfect at it. Some days I'm out of the bed and halfway through my day when I go, oh, by the way, God, what did you want me to do today? But if we take time, not just to ask the question, but to sit back and listen, and if we are willing to hear the wisdom of others when they also are being led by God, we will find that we are right where God wants us, and there is no better place to be. Let us pray.